Hi everyone, my name is Jack and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. Monday, September 14th, 2015, was remembered by 16-year-old Nolan Buchanan as the best day of his life. The day before, he had spent Sunday with his girlfriend. A traditional morning mass with his girlfriend's family, followed by a get-together with friends and a wonderfully romantic evening. Waking up on Monday morning, next to his favorite girl, the teenager felt like a free, successful, and influential businessman before whom the whole world is open. After all, he was now the owner of Buchanan Construction. The young man was going to inherit cars, a house, land, monetary assets, and made plans how he would manage the family business alone and certainly do it better than his father, who brought the company to bankruptcy. It would seem that what could go wrong? Already on October 1, 2015, Nolan Keith Buchanan was arrested at Benita High School in Benita, California by the El Dorado County Sheriff's Office. Nolan was incarcerated at the Juvenile Treatment Center, JTC, in South Lake Tahoe until June 13, 2018, when an El Dorado County jury of seven men and five women found Buchanan guilty of three charges. The jury took just two hours to reach a verdict. The young man was sentenced to 150 years in prison with the possibility of parole from the 25th year of his sentence. This is how his plan to take over the family business ended. Neighbors and classmates spoke of Nolan as a model kid and a good student. As far as I know, he was a good kid, Benita High School student Campbell Ruxton would later say in an interview. He always cared about school. He seemed very kind. He was very nice. I'm even surprised he was arrested. But what really happened in the Buchanan family? Let's break down this horrific case in detail. Molly first met Adam Buchanan when she came to apply for a job at his firm as an office manager. By the time they met, Adam was already divorced and raising his son Nolan from a previous marriage on his own. Cheerful, sociable, and cheerful blonde immediately attracted the attention of the owner of the company. The interest was mutual. Molly fell in love, started a romance that turned into a serious relationship and her move to Adam. Molly dreamed of a real, loving, friendly family and tried to build a wonderful relationship with her stepson. Soon she became pregnant. Gavin was born. People who knew the Buchanans claimed that they were a fairly close-knit family of four. The head of the family, who owned a construction company, earned enough to ensure a comfortable life and the family even purchased vacation property in El Dorado County, California. A small cabin sat on 19 acres in Greenwood, a rustic cabin with no electricity, water, sewer, or gas. Adam, who worked in construction, took an active role in remodeling the house, and the family began to visit there often. On September 13, 2015, at 10 a.m., members of the Garden Valley Fire Department responded to a wildfire in Greenwood Township in western El Dorado County, on Highway 193 between Cool and Georgetown. Upon arrival, they found the fire had destroyed 10 acres of the property. A cabin located on the property was still smoldering, but had burned to the ground. The fire department personnel observed charred remains in the ashes. The scene of the fire was not touched, and at 11 a.m. firefighters called the El Dorado County Sheriff's Office. No one had yet realized what was at the scene, Firefighters were almost certain that the victim of the wildfire was a pet trapped in the house. The arriving coroner was faced with a daunting task. The remains of the house were still smoldering, and there was no way to examine the inside of the house. They had to wait for the flames to finally die down and for the temperature to drop slightly. As the coroner examined the house, he smelled the sweet odor of burnt flesh and later discovered a human skull and a burned chest. It appeared that the tragedy had claimed someone's life. The officer requested backup. Officers from the sheriff's office arrived and conducted a thorough examination of the scene. The conclusion was obvious. The small, secluded, and remote cabin was not the primary residence of its owners. Rather, it was most likely a country cabin where people came to vacation. A Dodge truck and trailer were found on the property adjacent to the cabin. It was possible to run the license plates and find out who the car belonged to. The owner may have been the victim of the wildfire. It didn't take long to find out that the vehicle and trailer belonged to Buchanan Construction, a company owned by a man named Adam Buchanan. The man in question lived 160 miles from the scene of the accident, about three hours away in Benita, California. 
This information confirmed the assumption of the police, who decided that the house was just a country residence for those who vacation here from the hustle and bustle of the city. It remained to be seen who was inside, Mr. Buchanan himself or someone else. The name of the owner of the company gave the detectives their first clue with which they began their investigation. The Benita police officers were tasked with checking to see if all of Buchanan's family members were well and at home. They went to the correct address and were soon in the Buchanan's driveway where they noticed a white Ford pickup truck. At a knock on the door, Adam's 16-year-old son from his first marriage came out. He greeted the uniformed officers with surprise and asked what brought them to him. The officers decided to first find out who was in the house so as not to frighten the household. Perhaps the company car had been taken by someone from the company and not the owner himself. Nolan Buchanan said his father Adam had gone away for the weekend to his country estate, 160 miles away, with Molly and their eight-year-old son Gavin, and they were due back in the evening. According to him, his father had left him to look after the house. Investigators did not yet have sufficient reason to believe the remains in the cabin were those of the Buchanans, but the information received and the discovery of the remains, believed to be those of two people, by the evening of September 13th, was enough to report the family missing in the El Dorado County fire. The next day, September 14th, El Dorado County police went to Nolan's home to talk to him more thoroughly and try to figure out whose lives the fire had claimed. Officers were met by Adam's parents, Howard and Susan Buchanan. They said that their son, the owner of the burned-out cabin, does his own home repairs and therefore travels there very often. The parents were very concerned as they had not been able to contact their son or daughter-in-law until now. From the story, the officers learned that the house is connected to generators, but at the time of the tragedy, it had no electricity. There were, however, gas cylinders inside. This gave two theories. The fire could have been either accidental or intentional. By September 15th, the fire scene had cooled down and investigators were finally able to collect evidence including debris from a nearby fire pit. According to Denton James Peterson of the El Dorado County Sheriff's Office, new remains were discovered that changed the direction of the case. Police found a piece of skull with a bullet hole. At that point, we all realized that there was actually a homicide. This was not an accidental fire, reported the sheriff. The remains were collected and sent for forensic DNA testing. In the first set of remains, the bullet was lodged in the victim's thigh, the skull with the bullet hole, judging by its size, belonged to a child. The version of fatal accident dropped by itself. The version of murder came to the forefront. No one now doubted that the fire was a means of destroying the traces of the crime. It remained to find out under what circumstances the crime had taken place. Was it a burglary that had gone wrong? Or had the family taken their lives deliberately? But then by whom and why? Or could the crime be related to Buchanan Construction? a company where Adam Buchanan was president and chief operating officer and someone harbored a grudge against him due to a working relationship. Initially, investigators focused specifically on the latter theory. They also looked into Molly's life to determine if she had any enemies capable of the crime. Once those lines of inquiry stalled, officers turned their attention to problems in Molly and Adam's marriage. There proved to be plenty of them. Investigators learned that over time, Molly and Adam's relationship began to deteriorate, and at the time of the crime, they had been sleeping apart for quite some time. A diary was found in which Molly described abuse from Adam. Witnesses interviewed described rough treatment and abuse. According to them, Adam was rude not only to Molly, but also to the children. Molly's mother, Susie Slankard, admitted to investigators, there were times when I was afraid they would kill each other in one of their arguments. Molly did not sever her relationship with Adam, but would periodically take her son and leave to go to her parents' house and return a few days later until the next fight. It also turned out that the couple liked to hunt in the area where their country house was located. Since everyone was armed, the investigators assumed that during another quarrel, one of the spouses grabbed a gun and shot, and when he realized what he had done, he took his own life. However, there was an inconsistency. If the tragedy happened because of a conflict between husband and wife, it means that near the remains of one of them must necessarily be the instrument of crime, which, however, was not. 
Investigators speculated that the weapon may have been damaged in the fire and may not have looked as obvious as expected. Over the course of five days, forensic team members took turns removing ashes from the home. The search was conducted with surgical thoroughness, but did not yield the expected result. No weapons were found in the house. By this time came the data of forensic examination. The examination confirmed that the DNA of the bodies belonged to Adam Buchanan, Molly McAfee, and their eight-year-old son. All three victims had suffered gunshot wounds before the fire, and the angle of the bullet wounds ruled out the version that someone took their own life. The lack of firearms meant that someone else was in the house. A fourth person who shot the Buchanans and the investigation had to start over. Police had no choice but to turn to the 16-year-old son of the deceased. Nolan told officers that the family drove away in an old Dodge truck. According to the son, his father decided to use the company vehicle rather than his personal Ford, which was parked in the driveway, because he had loaded the truck and trailer with rocks that he was going to decorate the area near his country cabin. It was this truck that police found near the burned structure. When asked why Nolan did not go on vacation with his relatives, the young man, as in the first interview, said that he had a duty to look after the house and garden during the absence of his father and stepmother. Nolan also said that they had a neighbor growing forbidden grass on the edge of the Buchanan property, which caused his father to have frequent arguments with this neighbor, demanding that he stop planting the grass and threatening to go to the police. Talking about the family business, Nolan told of the company's financial difficulties. Things were not going well. The company was undergoing downsizing and the number of employees was down to five. From what his father said, the debts associated with the business were increasing rapidly. So now the investigation had a lot of useful information and the detectives had a suspect, a neighbor, especially since in that area, violent crime was often linked to the cultivation of illegal herbs. Detectives felt that the threat of going to the police could have led to the murder of Buchanan and his family. The problem was, no one had any idea which neighbor they were talking about. Investigators canvassed the neighborhood, interviewing all the homeowners in a row. The tactic was successful. They found a man who confirmed the story of a quarrel with Adam over growing a forbidden crop. But according to him, after a sharp conversation, the conflict was over. The neighbor had an alibi and another version turned out to be untenable. What remained to be dealt with was the financial crisis that had hit the family's business. On September 18th, the police visited Adam's company and interviewed the employees. Nolan's words were true. The company was in a sorry state. It was threatened with bankruptcy, as the amount of debts exceeded $30,000. Because of this, some employees were fired. It turned out that some of the former employees were extremely dissatisfied with the reduction and therefore could be involved in the crime. And that's where investigators got lucky. Over the weekend, the local high school organized a community cleanup day. The students were clearing debris from a business park just a mile from Adams Construction Company. It was there on September 19th that a small purse with a wallet and identification cards belonging to Molly McAfee and Adam Buchanan was found under one of the bushes. A .22 caliber rifle was lying nearby. Detectives immediately went to the scene of the discovery. The county sheriff's office made a new assumption. The perpetrator had massacred the Buchanan family with the found rifle and, covering his tracks, had taken their documents from the crime scene. The discovery was important because it meant that someone had traveled all the way to Greenwood to kill the family and then returned to Benita to dispose of the bag and murder weapon. It appeared to be a Benita resident, the proximity of the evidence found to the location of Buchanan Construction strengthened the theory that the boss was massacred by one of the disgruntled employees. Detectives sent the firearm and the bag of documents for examination, requesting a warrant to inspect the company's records and premises. Here, the investigators got lucky a second time. During the search, they gained access to a video surveillance camera installed on the firm's premises. By happy coincidence, the lens of the camera was directed not at the company's territory, but at the center of the parking lot. After this discovery, the case was just days away from being solved. 
Since it was already known that the family had gone out of town on Friday, investigators reviewed Friday's footage and were surprised to find that Adam had attached a trailer filled with rocks to a Ford F-150, not a Dodge truck as Nolan had told them. Detectives realized that the young man had deliberately manipulated the investigation. If the white Ford had towed the rock trailer to the cabin, then someone must have driven it back and parked it in the driveway of the Buchanan family home. Investigators re-interviewed Nolan, trying to keep him safe while getting as many details as possible. Nolan again recounted his weekend, where he had been, and who he had seen. Only this time they asked him what movie they had seen at the cinema, how he had paid for the shopping at the mall, and how he had paid for dessert on a date. The unsuspecting Nolan answered, with his father's credit card. The officers then applied for a warrant to search Buchanan's home in Benita, search the vehicles, and check financial records. The Ford automobile was still parked in the driveway. It was closely inspected, and they noticed reddish soil sticking to the wheels, similar to that in Greenwood. If the Ford had been used for a trip last weekend or earlier, traces of soil might have remained, but they would not have been as obvious. Unfortunately, the fire had destroyed the wheel tread marks near the country house, but the dirt buildup indicated that the car had probably been to Greenwood recently. Detectives tracked the bank card payments and found that Adam Buchanan had used his credit card on Friday, September 11th at fast food chain Taco Bell on his way to Greenwood. Nolan, on the other hand, claimed he stayed home, did not go with his parents, and had the credit card in his possession. Detectives went to the diner and checked the security cameras. They saw exactly what they expected, a white Ford instead of a truck. When detectives searched the Ford, they found a Taco Bell receipt dated September 11th that included not three but four drinks. Evidence collected at the scene of the fire similarly pointed to four drink cups. So Nolan was in the car? The next credit card transaction took place on Saturday, September 12th, at the Valencia Club Bar in Penryn, about 30 minutes away from the cabin. Adam's parents had previously told detectives about the bar. They said their son and daughter-in-law liked to drop in there after renovations to the cabin. Security cameras recorded the time the couple left the bar, and traffic cameras on the highway helped track the couple's route. A Ford F-150 headed toward the Buchanan cabin around 2.30 a.m. on the day of the fire, and at 3.30 a.m., drove in the opposite direction. In the first instance, the camera captured Adam and Molly in the vehicle. And in the second, only Nolan. A few hours later, on Sunday morning, September 13th, Adam's credit card was used to pay at three of Benita's establishments, Starbucks, McDonald's, and a gas station. The bank confirmed to investigators that Buchanan had only one bank card. The facts contradicted Nolan's stories. By this time, forensic results had come back. Nolan's fingerprints were found on the gun. He was arrested right in the middle of a high school class. Nolan Buchanan pleaded not guilty to the charges against him. He attempted to distort the story and claimed that it was his father who shot the family, after which he pointed a rifle at him, and he, defending himself, took the weapon away, accidentally shooting his father. Nolan insisted it was self-defense, attributing the fire and subsequent lie to a state of panic and extreme fright. That's why he took gasoline and set the house on fire to make it look like nothing had happened there. The defense continually focused the jury's attention on Adam's abuse of his own son and other family members. The medical examiner questioned the verdict because the bullet wound mark on a piece of Gavin's skull was consistent with a shot fired at nearly a 90-degree angle. Nolan, on the other hand, claimed that his and his brother's beds were next to each other and they were simultaneously awakened by the noise and screaming. It was at the moment of awakening that Nolan allegedly saw someone enter the bedroom and shoot Gavin. The shooter then pointed the rifle at him, and Nolan miraculously managed to push the attacker away. Under this scenario, the shot would have been fired at about a 45-degree angle, which was inconsistent with forensic evidence. The prosecution came to believe that Nolan shot his brother when they were alone in the house while their parents spent time at a bar. After waiting for his father and stepmother to return, Nolan shot them as well. Judging by where the bodies were found, Adam was killed first, followed by Molly. Nolan then took the rifle, his parents' papers, doused the bodies with gasoline, and set the house on fire. Then he went home, met his girlfriend and spent the day with her, creating an alibi for himself. 
On July 13, 2018, a jury found Nolan guilty of three counts of first-degree murder. As a result, he was sentenced to 150 years in prison with the possibility of parole after 25 years. Judge Kingsbury, in announcing the sentence, reflected on the verbal and physical abuse Nolan faced. On the testimony that Nolan massacred his brother because he didn't want him to go through the same horror or be forced to live with what his father had already managed to do to him. But as she did, she also listed facts about the premeditation of the crime and subsequent arson, the creation of alibis, and the plans to run the family business that Nolan had voiced to family members. The judge cited a failure to follow rules and deviant behavior noted by staff at the South Lake Tahoe Juvenile Treatment Center, where Nolan went after his arrest. Everyone has the opportunity to change, Judge Kingsbury told Nolan. I hope you will do everything in your power to do so. If you behave well, you will have a chance to get out on parole in 25 years under the Senate bill and Supreme Court rulings. It's up to you whether you take that chance or not. Nolan continues to insist he is innocent. If he ever gets out on parole, he will have to pay a huge compensation to the victims. The amount of the payout is unknown at this time. Thanks for watching, guys. Jack was with you. Subscribe to the channel and don't forget to click the bell to not miss new stories from around the world. See you soon. Take care.